How do we know where we're going? How can we follow directions? How can we go to a place that we've previously been before and then safely return to where we come from? And these might seem like fairly innocuous and simple questions with equally simple answers like, well, I don't know, man, I just do it, you know? Turn left over there. Pretty easy. But these are questions that behavioral neuroscientists have been trying to answer for decades. So let's start with a pretty basic example. You want to leave your room and go to the kitchen. So you leave your room, you take a right, you take 10 steps, you take a left, and then there you're in the kitchen. But why did you take a right and not a left? Why did you take 10 steps and not 7 steps? What if when you got to the wall you just kind of bumped into it repeatedly and didn't know what to do? How do you know that when you go from one place called the hall and then you leave you've now entered a new place called the kitchen? Well, a good portion of how you move throughout the world involves memories for places. If you had to go someplace new that you didn't have a memory of and you didn't have a map, well, you'd kind of be screwed. You wouldn't have any idea how to get there. But you know how to get to places that you've been before because you're relying on the memory of how you got there. You know that there exists a kitchen and you know all the right steps to take to get to the kitchen and how to get there safely and how to get there back. And so uh, in this video, we're going to cover how the brain actually stores memories of places and how it navigates throughout the world. So to start off, I'm going to cover what it actually means to move throughout the world and what different components and aspects there are of real world space. Space itself is composed of many attributes useful for the purpose of navigation. There are things like objects, the tree over there, this desk right in front of me, uh, there are distances. I am far away from that thing, but closer to this thing. Those two objects are five meters apart. There are boundaries. I can't go over there because there's a wall in the way. This is where the grass ends, and this is where the sidewalk begins. There's direction. Is it this way? Is it that way? North, east, south, and west. And all of the relationships between these things. So that object is to the left of that object's and is five meters away from me, pointing in this direction where I'm standing, and so on. Now, each of these attributes of space has their own proposed neural system that processes that specific type of spatial information. So, let's talk a little bit about them. You can't really talk about navigation and the perception of space without talking about the hippocampus. Uh, now the hippocampus is a brain region located in the medial temporal lobe, which basically just means it's you know, right here. Now the hippocampus is a bit hard to describe. You can kind of think of it like if you took a piece of paper and you rolled it up and folded it a whole bunch of times in on itself and then you gave it a slight bend. And that's kind of kind of how it's shaped. Uh, the hippocampus receives a whole bunch of information from all the sensory modalities, which is another way of saying uh, vision and sound and touch and smell and taste and all all of the sensory modalities, all of the senses. And what the hippocampus will do is that it will take all of this sensory information and it will process it in specific ways and then basically send it back out to where it came from, usually in the cortex and a whole bunch of other brain regions. Now the hippocampus is studied for two main functions. One is memory and the other is navigation through space. And when you think about it, it would make sense that these two things are related. Um, when you're moving throughout the world for the first time, you can probably get away without memory. I mean, you're not really doing that much, you're just kind of looking around and exploring. But if you want to go back to places you've previously been, like let's say if you want to go back to work, well it's kind of hard to go back to work if you don't actually remember or have a memory of where you work. These types of memories are called spatial memories, or memories of places in space, and they're key to navigation. So one important question to ask is, how does it do it? How does the hippocampus actually go about forming spatial memories and memories of places? Uh, and that's a question that neuroscientists have been trying to answer for a very long time, and they're still trying to answer. But what I'll talk about here in this video is a little bit about what we already know about the hippocampus and space. Now the hippocampus isn't just, you know, some blob of cells all mashed together. Uh, there's very distinct regions and layers of cells, like I talked about with the folded piece of paper. Uh, now within some of these layers of cells within the hippocampus, there are special cells that respond to certain cues in your environment, certain places. And these cells are appropriately called 
place cells. Now, place cells are neurons within the hippocampus whose activity uh, is completely dependent on, well, place. So if you stand over there, there will be certain cells in the hippocampus that will fire. And when you go move over there, over by the door, there will be other cells that, uh, that activate and send off signals. And the cells that were active over there won't fire anymore. So, to give you a brief example, when you're standing here, this cell might fire. And when you're standing over here, this cell will fire. And this one will stop firing. This is a very simplified model of how it works, but you get the basic idea. So how does the hippocampus actually form these place cells? Well, how cells become activated when you stand in certain areas in space is thought to be controlled by what the world looks like and the objects that are in it and your relation to those objects. So let's say you have posters on the wall. Well, when you look at the wall, the image of the poster goes through your retina and it goes into your brain and it eventually it'll go into your hippocampus and the place cells will form in relation to the things surrounding you. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So uh, let's, let's cover a little bit of the neuroanatomy behind that so that it can make a little bit more sense. So when you see objects in your surroundings, the image of these objects will hit the retina in your eye. The retina will take the light from this image and transform it into neural activity. And from there, uh, we're going to skip a bunch of the steps because there's a lot of unimportant stuff. It's kind of boring, a lot of stops along the way. Uh, but eventually, the signal from the retina will reach the back of the brain in a place called, quite appropriately, the visual cortex. And as you can assume by its name, it's involved in vision. From there, the information will move along the cortex from the back to the front, getting processed by other areas in the cortex along the way. These are areas like the perirhinal cortex and the retrosplenial cortex. And eventually, this information will feed into the hippocampus. And remember, this information originally came from the eyes, and so it represents visual information. Now, I'm not going to go into how exactly this visual brain signal gets transformed and attached to place cells in the hippocampus. Uh, it's a pretty complicated process, and how it exactly happens is still uh, a matter of intense study and conjecture. But, once these cells in the hippocampus begin to represent space, this space signal can then leave the hippocampus in the same way that it came in, and then be redistributed back out into the cortex, most notably to areas involved in controlling movement, so, you know, physical aspects of moving and navigating itself, as well as the prefrontal cortex areas for in-depth thinking, planning, and decision-making. So, the brain can take visual information that you get through your eyes uh, and process it in the cortex, and this processed information will feed into the hippocampus, and the cells in the hippocampus can then use that information to represent the space around you. One of the brain regions in the cortex that sends information to the hippocampus necessary for the formation of those place cells is something called the entorhinal cortex. Now, the entorhinal cortex also has some interesting spatial properties of its own. Um, within the entorhinal cortex, there are cells called grid cells. Now, just as place cells are active when you're standing in a very specific position or place in your environment, grid cells are active in a kind of grid formation. Uh, now, they're not just, you know, the place cells and grid cells aren't just the same thing in different places. Um, place cells will be active specific to certain uh, aspects of your environment and in specific locations, whereas grid cells are active um, in a kind of equidistant grid throughout the environment. They represent a kind of grid uh, of the space that you happen to be in. So here's a little schematic of what grid cell activity might look like. Uh, the process of how these cells come to represent equidistant space is still unknown, but you can imagine each cluster of activity in the entorhinal cortex uh, is representing some equidistant measure wherever you happen to be. So if we have a large sheet of neurons, which is how the neocortex is shaped, um, and as you move throughout the environment, where in the entorhinal cortex neural activity is happening will also move in a grid-style formation. So, if you'll bear with my poor animation skills, uh, the idea is that grid cells work something like this. If I move here, then these cells are active. And then if I move over here, then these cells will become active. And over here, these cells, and so on, and so on, and so on, as you move throughout your environment. 
When you're navigating throughout the world, and uh, let's say you want to go to a specific location, if you know where the place is, but you don't know the direction to take, well then it'd be pretty hard to get there. You'd kind of be screwed. So just as information about place comes from your eyes and the objects in the world around you, information about direction comes from your ears, specifically what are called the vestibular organs. You can kind of think of the vestibular organ as a carpenter's level, where depending on the angle of the level, the bubbles move across the liquid-filled tube. But instead of bubbles, it's a series of membrane tubes uh, in your ear. As your head moves around, the fluid in these vestibular tubes also moves around, exciting the membranes and sending information to your brain about where and how you are positioned. From these tubes in the ear, there is an extensive circuit that processes this signal into valuable directional information. Some of these brain areas include the dorsal tegmental nucleus, the lateral mammillary nucleus, several different thalamic nuclei, retrosplenial cortex, post and pre subiculum, and the entorhinal cortex. Uh, these areas all form what are usually referred to as the head direction circuit. And I'm not going to go into each, you know, what each brain region does and how it processes information, because, you know, that would take forever. Uh, but I will say this each of these areas is said to have head direction cells in it, which means that. These are cells in each of these areas that will respond when the organism is pointed in a certain direction. Uh, each of these areas can be thought of as a step along the way to what is most likely the final and most important neural representation of direction, which is in the subiculum and entorhinal cortex. So how do these cells in the brain become tuned to a certain direction? Well, just like all the other cells that we've been talking about, like place cells and grid cells, head direction cells will attach themselves to some prominent object in your environment. So the first time you walk into a room, you'll see some object, and then all of the cells that we've talked about in this head direction system will fire in relation to that object. But interestingly, if the lights go out, your head direction cells will still fire when you're pointing in a specific direction because you have the vestibular information that we talked about that will maintain it. Just because the lights go out doesn't mean that your ears will stop working. So. We have place cells in the hippocampus that represent specific areas in real space. We have grid cells in the entorhinal cortex that represent a kind of metric layout of the environment. And we have head direction cells in the subiculum that provide us with information about which direction we are headed. All three of the spatial neurons are located in the same general region of the brain. And here's a picture to illustrate this. We, here we have the subiculum, the entorhinal cortex, and the hippocampus all together. Information about the outside world enters the brain through our senses, gets processed by several regions in the cortex, before ultimately ending up here in this area. How each of these individual components combine into a kind of unified spatial representation is still an active area of neuroscientific study. So far, we've talked about individual brain areas and the anatomy of how we move throughout the world, uh, as well as the specific cell types involved in these functions. Now, we're going to move on to talking about how the brain might navigate throughout the world in real time. So I'm going to be talking about a study that I found, a very cool study, done by Hugo Spears and Eleanor McGuire at the University College London. So, what they did was that they found some London taxi cab drivers and scanned their brains using an fMRI while navigating through a virtual map of London. Now, an fMRI is an imaging machine that can observe brain activity happening in real time over time. And so what these researchers did was that they scanned the taxi driver's brains while they were going through virtual London, as well as asked them to give an account of their thoughts while they were navigating through the virtual London. In this way, they could see what brain areas were active during different aspects of navigation, as well as match that brain activity to certain thought patterns. So maybe there's a particular uh, pattern of brain activity that happens when you see a familiar landmark, and then use that landmark to turn left. Or maybe there's a you know, type of uh, brain activity related to planning a route in your head before you actually take the route. Um, a study like this offers a very interesting way of matching thinking, behavior, and brain activity all at once. So, what did they find? Well, here's a really great image from the article. Now, uh, this image is not mine, it's theirs, so we'll give them all the credit where credit is uh, rightly deserved. Uh, and what we are looking at is uh, psychological functions, or thought patterns, uh, mapped onto brain areas, also mapped onto an actual map. So it's a bit complicated, but basically the squiggly line is the route that the drivers took in the virtual map. Uh, so the line represents streets and turns and distances of the virtual map, 
and the colors are used to differentiate what the drivers were thinking and what brain areas were active during that part of the route. So for example, during certain parts of the route, the drivers are expecting to see something soon, maybe a monument or a familiar street sign that they know is coming up. Uh, and this is represented in brown. And when they are in this state of expectation, the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, which is basically just the kind of you know top middle part of the prefrontal cortex, it lights up. And when the driver is listening to the passenger tell them where to go, represented in red, uh, the left hippocampus lights up. Uh, and this is a pretty cool experiment because it allows us to look at brain activity and thought patterns and behaviors that are related to the brain activity all at once. So there's a lot going on, as you can tell by the picture, but uh, let's just cover what I think would be the most important parts to take home. While the hippocampus is very important for storing memories of places, uh, during navigation itself, this study has found that the hippocampus plays a very important role in the planning of routes, and that it might be using memories of previously learned places to do this planning. When exploring new routes for the first time, the retrosplenial cortex was heavily active. Now this would make sense, like we talked about earlier, in that the retrosplenial cortex is very heavily associated with the hippocampus and a necessary part of the formation of new spatial memories. And finally, the prefrontal cortex, right here in the front of your head, a brain area that's been studied for a very long time with regard to planning and executive functions and decision making, uh, was found to be involved in, well, planning of routes. So, to recap on everything that we've just talked about, there are specific areas in the brain whose nerve cells will respond to various aspects of your environment. There are place cells that encode information for specific places. There are grid cells, which encode a layout of your environment. And there are head direction cells, which encode which direction you happen to be facing. And all of these cell types are located generally within what is referred to as the hippocampal formation, or brain areas that are very closely connected to and associated with the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the brain area most strongly associated with navigation through the world. And it's even thought to be the brain region where memories of places are formed and stored. But no brain area can exist in isolation. And as covered in the study that we talked about, there are several brain regions, especially in the cortex, that send information to and receive information from the hippocampal formation, collectively forming what we might call a navigation system. If you like my videos, and uh, you find them helpful, then please like them, share them, and subscribe to my channel. And thank you for watching.